This is an interesting photograph. I showed this photograph to Roy DiCarava. Roy didn't like the photograph. And I brought it to show you, but what are the reasons why he didn't like it? Because you can only see the whites of the kid's eyes. And he talked about the stereotypical photographs of black people being showed with pop eyes, bug eyes, or the whites of their eyes. So he considered this a, not a successful photograph. All right, so this is a matter of opinion, but I, I, I understood what he was saying, and I took it as good advice. Right, this is right at the building where I lived at. I saw this kid on the way out of the building. This is an organization, uh, How You Act, was a federally funded program that if it had not been for How You Act, I would not have been able to start out my career as a photojournalist. Uh, I went there, and I mentioned to you before, I went there uh, to get a job. They had a weekly newspaper, and they hired me. So my first year or so in photography, I'm working as a journalist. This is one of those metaphor photographs. Everybody gets the metaphor, right? Most of the lenses I used were 50 millimeter lens. When I first got my first Nikon, it was a 50 millimeter lens and a 105. And eventually somebody, I had a liker after, this is with a Nikon, I got a liker, and one of the members loaned me a 28 millimeter lens. Did anybody shoot with a 28? Okay, well, you gotta remember, I go from a 50 to a 28, so the first week, I got my fingers, my feet, I got everything in that lens. But it was training, and he trained me to have a better sense of composition because this lens was so wide that you had to learn how to control the space, okay? So these were just lessons I learned from members of Kamoinge. This is the block I lived on. And my building is a little further down. Easter Sunday, this is Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday in Harlem particularly, in New York in general because it's a Catholic holiday, but Easter Sunday for black people is the reason to get dressed up to go to church. And the one thing you buy is a fancy or a pretty hat. This is a shot on Halloween. Another series of things. Kids dress up, adults dress up. So any event that I could, I'd go out on that day and shoot, right? Because now you don't just walk the streets like I could do in the 60s. Uh, people were, I guess, were, and to say they were naive about journalists. So guys walking the streets with a camera was no big thing. But interestingly enough, in my neighborhood, guy who was hanging out in front of the liquor store, a drinker, he pointed at me in my camera and he said, you remind me of Ouija. And I looked at him and I thought he was talking through the alcohol vapors. But there's a photographer, white photographer called Ouija, that you need to look up his work. I brought primarily black photographers, but there are a lot of white photographers I got influenced by. But I wanted you guys to start off with us, our black photographers, and what I mean by us is all black photographers. Start off with us, but then find out because everybody's been influenced by somebody. Okay? This is a very interesting character. You might see him in a couple of more photographs. He was the block. There was a term called wino. Anybody ever heard the term? Uh, wine, it was a cheap wine. And guys that couldn't afford alcohol drank wine. So he drank wine. But he was, at one point before he got addicted to alcohol, he spoke well, he had a, a large wardrobe. So when you see him, this is a garbage bag. That's what they used to use. These are old burlap bags they used to use for hauling garbage. And he was wrapped in this. But he was a character. He was the block character. These are stories about black life. Okay, I try not to shoot the drunkards and all the other stuff. Hold on one second, show. Everybody, as you look at this photograph, 
some of the technical things we were just talking about to you. I want you to look at this image and see where this man is, the background, the exposure, how Sean knew what was most important here, okay? The background, but where this gentleman is. It's a lady. Lady? Sorry. Yeah, it's all right. But it's timing. Timing. As well, if she, how many times she may have moved, if she takes a half a step back, the light isn't on her face the same way. So again, being in position. Also too, with photography and doing photojournalistic work, it's also too about anticipation. Being patient. Definitely there's, there's times where you just have to be still and just wait and almost just watch your subject and the subject isn't the most important, is, is one half of the photograph, the background is just as important. Don't think the background is not significant. The background is just as important as your subject. This was done on 125th Street. You're gonna see a lot of work 125th Street was sort of the mecca for Harlem, and 125th Street was the shopping area, right? So that's where all the clothing stores, shoe stores, theaters, all right? So I would go up there, and would, like Russell said, you could sometimes just find a place, sit, and wait for the picture to come, right? And a lot of work was done up there. That's why I used to get my cameras loaded up and head up to 125th Street. All of these pictures, these black and white pictures were taken with Tri-X film, 400 ASA. I used that for 30 years, that one kind of film, 30 years. You needed the high ISO because you were shooting in the streets, in dark hallways, on the subway, on the buses, so 400 ASA. Interesting enough, when I got my first digital camera, I tried to set it up like my film camera and just, it didn't work, right? So I, I had to relearn how to set up a digital camera as opposed to an analog camera. I don't shoot black and white anymore. Once I started shooting digital, for myself, I figured why shoot digital black and white when I could shoot digital color and then turn it into black and white, right? So that gave me the option. I shot black and white film for about 30 years. And the only time I shot color is when I was traveling or shooting particular events like parades because the costumes lend themselves to color, right? But I shoot all color now and I sometimes decide to do it in black and white. And like he said, there's so much software out there. So when people bring that issue up about digital versus analog, it's a little, it's a little I don't issue. think it's an issue personally. It's a little issue. You understand? It is about the image. It should not have anything to do with what camera you shot it with, what film you shot it with, whatever. It's about the image. I wanted to say one thing about this image, and this is a wide angle lens. This is a 28 millimeter lens. And the boy in the uh, fire hydrant, that's what we call him in, in New York, is a shot within itself with the gates behind him. You could just do that because the gates are always a metaphor for me. But the two religious paintings were the reason why I added the church into it. We have a lot of churches in Harlem, so the one thing that they always used to say about Harlem, you had churches and liquor stores. Sometimes they were right up against next to each other. But, and they, were, they have a term called storefront church. So these were churches that moved into ground level commercial spaces, right? But I have uh, a special interest in religious symbology, and I thought the, the juxtaposed between the two religious in the window in the church and this young boy at the hydrant and the gates behind him. So at least from this photograph is full of metaphors for me. Now let me just say this, because we've talked about this amongst themselves. I am not a photographer who engages anybody. I am not an engaging photographer. I want to creep in, take the picture, and be on my way. Uh, 
And most of the time, if you want to talk, I don't want to talk. I want to try to, for me, I need to stay in a zone. I need to stay in a zone where I can be conscious to catch this. Because it was some, they were, I don't know what the situation was, right? But it might have been just that the little girl's nose was running. It wasn't anybody any grief or anything. My nose is running. We've all seen that. We've all seen kids, their nose run, doesn't stop them. They're not even conscious of it. And I think that's all it was. And they kind of caught me because you'll see, very rarely you'll see people actually engaging me, taking their picture. Most of the time I try to catch them unaware. Maybe I didn't make it clear, but that's why I was talking about this particular image. I said I could have shade, changed the background and just shot him with the fence. Without the, without the, the church back there. That was the background. And that, those two figures in the church was an important part of the background. But I realized that this could be two photographs. I could crop this right where the fence starts behind him. Another picture altogether. All right. So now, and again, I learned for me is that when you use a wide angle lens, you're documenting <coughs> because you're getting more of the background, more signs, more architecture. You're getting all of this stuff with a wide angle lens. You don't get with a close up telephoto lens. Yeah. Prime lens means one fixed lens. Right? So this was a 28. You can have a 35. So the, the lens breakdowns, you have 28, 35, 45, 50. Could be wide angle. Anything above that becomes telephoto, right? So from 65 on up becomes telephoto. The most practical lens they wrote about back then was 35 to 105. It was the most used lenses. Parameters. Yeah, right. So this, but again, this was when you had one lens and you had to deal with that all day long unless you had another lens or two in your bag. I started using two cameras because I found, <clears throat> maybe you guys have run into this, that you're in a situation and you want to quickly change lens. You ever get one jammed up and, you, you know, so I found that it was easier for me to use. So I used two cameras. If I'm going out to shoot an event, I'm having two cameras on me and might have another or two in the bag. Okay. Which lens do you use? I use, uh, because now we have 35, um, um, we have uh, zoom lenses. I use a 35 to 105 as the most practical lens. And then from there, I use a 70 to 200. The 70 to 200 is to eliminate the background. The 35 is to add the background. I want to just add something, everybody. The closer you get to the people you're photographing, the more every, the more the person who you're photographing is going to connect with you, and as well as the more your pictures will resonate with people who are looking at them. The closer you are, and don't get into this habit of standing far away. Yeah, and shooting with long lenses. <laughs> no, not a good idea at all. Don't even get into that habit. Don't. You need to be able to engage people. You want people to learn who you are and also too, just as a sense of honesty and trust. If you're shooting from across the street, somebody may question really what your motives are. Yeah. All right? It looks like you could be spying. It doesn't look like you are doing some honest work. So with having... You know, with a zoom lens, I would only say use a zoom lens only unless there is some physical restriction that does not allow you to get closer to the people who you're photographing. Russell, let me say something. A zoom lens doesn't necessarily, I use a zoom lens close. So I'm not, I don't use it to bring something closer. I use it to eliminate the background. I shoot it wide open. I shoot events, like I say, I shoot parades. And when I started shooting parades in New York, you might have 35,000 people show up. So you didn't have to worry about people in, unimportant people in the background to what you're trying to get to. But the last parade is a million and a half people show up. So now I have to use this long lens because I'm trying to isolate the subject. 
I've shot pictures I, of, uh, I do the Korean Day Parade. So I do all cultural groups. It's not only black groups, but I do all cultural groups. I had an exhibition. And people kept coming up to me and said, gee, I didn't know you went to China. I didn't know you went here. No, this is New York. But, it, but because I isolated a lot of the architecture, a lot of the other recognizable things that say, oh, that's New York. That's a hot dog stand, or that's a this, or that's a that. People were transported when they saw the work. And that was the idea. So for me, a telephoto lens is not to shoot something far away. For me, it's to shoot something close, but to eliminate the background. I shoot it wide open. Somebody, we had this discussion about depth of field before. So depth of field is you shoot any lens wide open, you eliminate the background. And with, the longer the lens is, the softer the background becomes. Pictures are made in the heart and up here in your mind, okay? The camera is just a tool, but you have to know how to work your camera. You have to know how to control your camera. You have to know how to set your camera to get the picture you want, to know which shutter speed is going to create the right effect, to have the right exposure. When Ruddy just gave the demonstration up here with the brother in the front, Standing up, when he stood up and when he turned him around, if you had your camera on automatic in a low light situation, okay, your camera is going to try to get a general, a general, okay, focus for this particular low light area. Now, if you have your camera on a manual setting, you will be able to control the light and get the picture accurately. This is super important. Or next thing you probably have experienced is putting your camera on automatic and you try to make a photograph and all of a sudden the flash pops up. Yeah. <laughs> One of the okay. things too that we have to understand that all of these photo photographs that I'm showing now, you had to focus your camera. That's right. These are no autofocus shots. And again, that's what I meant by timing. Freddie said something earlier and it was the thing that I always talk about. When I left the house and I planned to shoot, I would have my ISO set because if I'm shooting in the street, the one thing I know I'm going to have to deal with is speed. So the one thing you do, if I, I know I'm going to be shooting on the street, the thing is about speed, people might be moving, I set my shutter speed first, right? That's, what I'm, that's going to be my primary interest. But now if I'm going to the park to shoot landscapes or something like that, then I'm going to set my aperture first. So what you go to shoot decides how you set up your camera. People try to set up their camera any kind of way, no matter what they're shooting. You cannot do that. The subject and the scene tells you how to set your camera up. You always have to understand that. And now, when we were talking about telephoto lenses, this particular photograph, for me, so it's the young girl, but it's the sign behind the young girl. The background, the background. Now, if you have, a, if I had a long zoom, focus on the girl, you'd miss the sign, we'd all be blurred, and you wouldn't know what that was. So when I shot earlier, I shot with wide angle lenses, and it gave me a historical reference. And that's what, for me, what documentary is about. You're doing a historical reference. I had decided at one time this store had been there since I was this girl's age. It just closed maybe about 10, 15 years ago. So the store had been there 40 years. I wanted to go in and there were stores in my neighborhood that had been there. It was a barbershop, a couple of places that had lasted for 40 years. And I wanted to go in and interview them and take portraits of them. And I think about those things. I don't contend to do them. I'm not. I'm not a people person in that sense, right? I, I, and I, one of the things I consider myself is I can't do everything. Mm -hmm. I try to understand what I do best and concentrate on that. That's right. Right? And I think that's important for everybody to know what you do best. That's right. Then concentrate on that. Now, it does not mean that you don't do other things, but you should know what your best card is, OK? And again, I, I've ate in that place over the years, growing up. And I want to just add something, everybody, is looking at the work that Sean is presenting right now and thinking about the work that you're creating. 
all of you are in position to create an archive and a historical reference for what Ethiopia is right now and in the future. So everybody knows what's happening in Casanchez. What Casanchez is going to look like in five years is not what it looks like right now. True or false? I don't know if anybody in here is documenting Casanchez, but I hope you are. And again, as we are here, all of the change that is taking place, what you know historically from your parents, what you see, it's all super, super important. So how Sean made this photograph, that sign says fish and chips, 35 cents, 50 cents. <laughs> you can't even get a pack of gum. The same fish and chips would cost you $5 cents. in Harlem now. Exactly. Maybe more. <laughs> so, That's what's key about this. Right. And another thing over here, just to say, shooting signs. When shooting signs, make sure when you are shooting anything that has a sign that it has some significance. Because... If a person can't speak the language, it doesn't mean anything. But this sign over here, it adds so much more depth to the photo, as well as to, it gives you a sense of time. You know what era, this had to be a long time ago. And let me say, <laughs> this is before McDonald's. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, no, I mean, seriously, so these, these fish and chips joints were really important to working class people. And that they could get a good meal for a reasonable price. I get the chicken prices, I mean, 50 cent, 35 cent. This is a place called La Marqueta. It was a Latin market and in Harlem, but right on the borderline between Black Harlem and Spanish Harlem. There was a big market there. And this is where my mother used to take us to shop for fresh vegetables, right? And I went there one day and everywhere I could, I don't even need to tell you what this photograph's about, but it's about the young boy being taught, right? This is a teaching photograph. This is a lesson about, hey, come, you come into the market with me, you're gonna work with me, I'm gonna show you how this is done. Ah, another metaphor. The name of the, the supermarket, the cops. And let me tell you something very interesting about kind of gentler period. Those white hats they have on are air, uh, air raid warden hats, right? So when they used to have air raids, they, the, these were not police hats. But this is during one of the Harlem riots. This is as much as they had as police riot gear. Now, everybody knows what that looks like now. All right, that, this was police riot gear back in the 60s. <laughs> so do you understand the importance of documenting the time that you live in? And, and this is the point, really interesting, because it's like antiques. I'm into purchasing stuff, I problem with it, but what was commonplace, this is commonplace now, somebody 50 years will now say, well, look, this is what they used to drink back 50 years ago. Time is what makes something important. Yeah, I want to just add to what Sean just said, everybody. Looking at this photograph, in the work that you're doing, you are going to have to make split-second decisions. What is most important? Is it this person's face? Is it the background? Is it the person's face and the background? You see how Sean used the space? The spacing, the framing. Gives you a sense of time. Also to the people in the photograph. So learning also to the lines. Look at the lines in the pictures. And what? the fact that they're standing next to garbage. I left that in. I could have cut it out. There you go. But they are standing next to garbage. So, and again, these are series. They are photographs that I did with what I consider metaphors. Yes. Yeah, so, 
And again, this is that wide angle lens that I thought I got stuck with because I couldn't understand why this guy, because normally if you had a 50 millimeter lens, you would not have been able to get this kind of space. You would not have been able to work with this kind of space. And that's what I'm talking about as a document that if it was journalism, I could have cop captured them, still a statement, but as with a wide angle lens, now you talk about. And look, food prices, look at Tenderloin. And look at, look at what, what things the prices are, guys, compared to what we're paying for now. That's what's key about, and that's what's important about you documenting your time, because everybody knows the prices are going through the roof. So whatever you buy today, next week, a month, six months from now, is going to be more expensive. It's never going to come down. Every time I get an assignment, the first thing I do is I go on my computer and I research the assignment. First thing I do, I figure out who I'm going to photograph, what they look like. Now, one of the things that is beautiful about this panel is the generation in this panel. Sean, 50 years, me, 15 years. And the difference between that is Sean would sell 12 pictures for a story. Magazines, online, wants one. <laughs> That's the difference in years. One. So you have one opportunity to tell your story. It doesn't mean that you don't shoot the other 12. It just means, am I gonna make, am I gonna make 12 images of the same? Or am I gonna use one image to tell the whole picture? Or am I gonna, as Sean say, take some smoking images and also take some images that support the smoking images? You understand? You, you have to, everybody here have to make that call. You walk in, after my research, I walk in on the assignment and I then make a judgment as to what am I getting. Am I getting smoking images? You might go to an event and there, nothing is there, but you can't go back to your editor saying, well, guess what? There was nothing. There was nothing. Because you won't get work again. <laughs> you, have to, you have to make images. That's right. So you, you have to make that call. Sometimes you go on an assignment and it is smoking images everywhere. Sometimes you have to take some smoking, some, and most times I find myself using one thing to tell the story. I just follow one thing throughout the whole assignment and allow that to tell the story. Another way to bridge the communication gap is to have your pictures to show people walking with your pictures. So whether you have an iPad or even if you have prints, all of us being here, none of us can speak Amharic. I've been here, this is my third time. But in walking the streets, what do I do? I show people pictures of my work in Brooklyn on my iPad. I've walked the streets, I've had 20 people gather around me looking at my photographs. And what happens? Everybody wants a picture. <laughs> now, it's trust is built. Trust. They see I'm photographing people with respect. They see dignity. They see it's classy. As well, the intent. All of this. So photography is a universal language. Just like food, just like music. Photography is a universal language. This is why I said earlier, when photographing signs, it's very, very important that the sign makes a statement. It has to make a statement to add depth to the photograph because if you can't speak the language, What's the point? When people see themselves in your photographs, are they going to feel good about how you've captured them? Very, very important. So when you are capturing a moment, and there are times like this, what Sean was saying, the decisive moment, there are times where you won't have a second or a minute to introduce yourself, you know, to capture the picture because the moment is unfolding right before your eyes. 
but you can catch that picture. And like with like Ruddy, I'm the same way. I feel I have a responsibility to introduce the people who I'm photographing really to the world. I want to honor them in a way, and I want the world to see really who we are, to learn about, okay, this everyday young man or, or woman. I want to honor the people who I photograph. I look to make images that even when people are at their worst, they still may have some sense of dignity. So it's meeting people on their level. And that's something you definitely have to feel comfortable to do. So in talking to someone homeless, you know something? If they're sitting down, you don't stand up. You get down on the ground. You get down, you look them in their eyes, you humanize them. You engage them. And your photos could be interactive. So the next part of this is if you're shy, okay? If you're shy, you're a bit reserved, this is something you're uncomfortable doing, you have to be ready. Again, like I said yesterday, there's no growth if you're not ready to be uncomfortable. There's no growth if you're not ready to be uncomfortable. You will be limited in your work if you just stay in a specific place. The same thing with your cameras. A 28 millimeter lens, a 50 millimeter lens, you even go to medium format cameras, large format cameras, they challenge you differently. The cameras that I shoot with, Roloflex Hasselblad, 10 to 12 images on one roll. You hear that everybody? 12 pictures, that's it. The four by five camera, eight by 10, one. one. Two. Maybe two. two. So, again, it's about being precise, as well as to engagement. I just wanted to say something and to repeat it, is that practice. That's right. You gotta shoot, I don't care what it is. Shoot, all the time. I carried a camera around every day for 40 years. There were guys that stopped me when I got into the small cameras that they didn't see a physical camera on me, they said, well, man, after all this time you finally stop, I go in my bag, pull out a camera. What happens is it allowed me to shoot all the time. Sure. That is one of the reasons why I turn to this small format, the camera side, because I can keep one with me. I didn't have to have a $2,000 camera that I had to concentrate on protecting it or keeping it safe or not banging it or dropping it. That's a whole nother thing. That takes up part of your mind when you have your camera with you all the time. All right, so shoot all the time. Shoot and find out what the latitude is. I tell everybody, shoot in your homes. I know homes are dark. Shoot in your homes. So find out what ASA works. I'm old school, so I say ASA because I dealt with that for so many years but now it's ISO. So when you hear me say ASA, it's by mistake, and I mean ISO. The same thing, they just changed the name. I left this picture on because I just wanted to say one thing about it, that this brother had one of the earliest Polaroids. I have one. And I just wanted you to see where we've come from that to what we're all using now. You understand? So this was maybe, what, eight exposures on the Polaroid film? Mm, 10. 10. 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So 10 exposures on the Polaroid, but this is, and you can tell by the way he was dressed, we call them dandies or hustlers or whatever. But it's, again, you know, huh? Guamada. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, again, this is my block. These are guys that I hung out with. You're going to see pictures of people who, again, and I keep saying this about you, you start in your own community. Right. You don't have to go, you know, I had students who would say, well, Professor, where do I go for a sign? No. So you start from there and your circle gets bigger. The more you learn, the circle gets bigger. 
the circle gets bigger, but one thing you'll have is a good document on your family, your friends, your loved ones, your community. Uh, this is a Cadillac, I can't tell you what year, uh, but I think this is in 70s, 60s, late 60s, early 70s. But the design of the Cadillac was so out, and again, there's another one of these contradiction photographs of this guy who's out of it, laid up against this car, which is absolutely beautiful to me. I mean, look at the lines on that sucker. You don't even have to have the whole car. But his knees make the same lines. Yes. So it's all about design and rhythm. Let me just say this because nobody's mentioned this yet. I'm a child of jazz. Started listening to jazz when I was about 13 because of older people in the family and stuff like that. But I've listened to jazz all of my life. I'm not into con contemporary music. And I have to say rap is the form is cool, but the content is terrible. Wu-Tang. Yeah, so, <laughs> and there's a difference between form and content. Right. So these are things that we're gonna throw out there. If you're not clear about them, you need to ask us about them. But I just wanted, this is a photograph. Now again, I tend not to shoot people that are under the influence and stuff like that, but it was the car and him up against the car that led me to do the photograph. <coughs> Let me just say something. I just put that other small camera away, but everybody saw it. I'm at a shooting, uh, I guess at, um, I can't remember, remember what event it was. But I'm sitting with the press, with my little teeny, teeny camera, because I'm shooting video. And I'm sitting in the front row, and a brother that I don't know taps me on the shoulder and points at my little camera. He says, what does that camera want to be when it grows up? Now, I kind of looked. Normally, I would have been disturbed, but I understood what it showed was his lack of knowledge about what is out there exactly. and what you can use. So I didn't say anything to him, but what these cameras now can produce. Now again, I will never say that you cannot, the 35 millimeter camera in its form is not one of the most practical things. It's speed. I'm not dealing with speed now anymore. Because every time I try to do that with these little cameras, it doesn't work. But it works for 70% of what I want to do. I can't beat that. 70, I'll take 70%. Okay, but for you guys that are journalists, if your phone can do it, my cameras can do it. Right, so I just wanted to, to, to understand, the more you learn about this, and I do a lot of study about what's out there on the market, what I can suffice with without spending a lot of money for it, because I'm not getting paid as a journalist anymore. When I got paid as a journalist, I had tons of equipment because I could pay for, my work paid for them at the end of the year. And it's something else you might want to think about. What I used to do is keep a separate account. So when I got paid for a job, I put money in that job account. So when I had to buy equipment, the equipment came out of the job account and not out of the household account. That, I, I don't think you would know the significance of this photograph, but look at the, the hair. This photograph is really about hair. This was just right at that cusp between Afros and black women and men starting to wear froze. And this is again, this is like the late 70s into the 60s. Now, half of the people laughed at these, this group as they went by. How can you not do something with your hair? Right, this is, these were pioneers. That's what I look at them as. You know, the woman felt strong enough to have her kids say, oh, I'm going that way, but I want y'all to go that way. And I know the, the political, social, cultural reasons why I want you to go that way, right? So this is one of the reasons, again, why I took the picture. You never, now this is the deal, you don't know that this is going to happen. I don't tend to find that most of my photographs don't have groups in them, so, if you're prepared for the individual photograph of the person and then here comes six people that you want to photograph, you have to be able to adjust. readjust your mind and your camera. And you could see that this one is probably done at F22, F16. Look at the depth of field. As far as you can see, you can distinguish people. 
In, in the United States, and, and particularly Harlem, but in the United States, that move when people start to become black consciousness. This photograph is about black consciousness. I am not going to the beauty parlor, have them cook my hair like they normally do, and I'm going to go natural. I'm going to go, I'm going to start to relate to African culture and Africanness, and I'm going to start being this consumer American about my hair and my children's hair. So and that was one of the deals, because there were times you would see women who were natural hair, but the kids were all kind of straightened and stuff. I'm not going to do that to my children. I'm, I'm, it's for me. Well, but this woman said, hey, this is for us. This is not for me or them. It's for us. I've always tried to photograph culture. I'm a culturalist, right? I always liked design. So that Cadillac car was about design. It wasn't about the guy being out of it. It was about him being there. And if the guy came out that owned that car, we all know what would have happened, right? He would have been up there. There was a photograph that a, a photographer did uh, called Buford Smith, one of the members of Camoingay. And it was a Cadillac like this but it was in front of a tenement. And the contradiction was talking about somebody who bought this car lives in this tenement. And that's a contradiction in terms. So you're talking about the politics. You're talking about the culture. You're talking about the awareness of what is important. Hey, man, you know, clothes. Mentioned clothes before. I might not have anything, but if I dress well, people will think I got something. You know, so you do these things to improve your worth, your worth to other people. But wait a minute, but look at the house you live in. You got this big fine car, but, and that's a contradiction. A car like that in Harlem is a contradiction in terms of anyway. So for me, it's about the politics, it's about the culture, and it's about living in a black community and the contradictions we see. All of us see contradictions in our communities. I photograph contradictions. It's because of from my political background. I, I'm a, I grew up as a civil rights photographer, so I did all these demonstrations in different cities and stuff like that, and it was about black consciousness. This photograph is about black consciousness. I was up there when black consciousness, the movement, started. So that's what a lot of my photographs have to do with, and some of this have to do with the way the community works on a daily basis. I have something in mind about what I want to photograph. Now, there are always the occasions where you didn't expect this to happen. This particular group, I didn't expect that to happen. You know, I'm looking for something else. Sometimes you be looking for something, and the thing that you're not looking for is the most important thing. Okay, so that's the, all you have to do is be open. That's the point. Be open, have your camera ready. That's the deal. I used, uh, for a lot of these things, I used the lacquer, which Ruddy uses. Wrapped it around my wrist and I kept it down to my side. Never carried a camera around my neck. Never carried a camera in the back. So as soon as I see something, all I have to do is raise it and compose it and shoot.